What's up, everybody? It's time for Wealth Webinar Series, and today we are going to do a five-part it's actually kind of a six part video series where we're going to teach you all about the infinite banking concept, the process where you can take back the banking functions in your life and how you can be the bank. And I am really excited to have Brent Kessler and Mr. Stephen Nagy with me, as well as James here operating the camera. So thank you all for being. This is going to be exciting. So we're going to get into it. All right. So, Brett, what, what are we going to talk about today? Oh, my gosh. I mean, there's so many topics to talk about. I think a couple things that we should talk about is how actually banks work, you know, and what happens when you put money into a bank. And we also should st talk about how a policy is like starting a brand new business from scratch. It's identical. And I think if people understand that and they really knew exactly what was going on in these policies, that they would be lined up out the door to get in, to get some, because it really is, I mean, a wealth building vehicle, a wealth building tool, and it doesn't require you to take any risk. It doesn't require you to work any harder, change your cash flow, um, or also it doesn't require you to lose control. We're simply just adding one step in our financial life. And I kind of thought about this. I was out in Phoenix this past Saturday. I was teaching at a live event out there and it was a convention for a bunch of real estate invent right just like a whole bunch of investors and i thought to myself it was a three-day webinar it was friday saturday and sunday a live it was a three-day live event a live seminar and here i am out in scottsdale arizona the weather is beautiful this time of year in scottsdale right and all these people are in this room and they're trying to gain all this knowledge for three solid days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I just kind of had an epiphany. And I thought to myself, people come, they travel, they spend all this money to go and watch and learn all of this different stuff, right? So it's like in this example, it was about investing in real estate. It was a three-day deal. And I had 90 minutes of the segment. And I just made a comment to the whole entire group. I said to them, I said, I want you to look at what you guys are doing. Here you are. So, okay, for three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you all are sitting in this cold, damp, musty room at the hotel. It was at the Hilton by Doubletree is where we were at in a conference room. And you're sitting here and you came to these things to learn how to make money, which is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. I mean, at least you came. A lot of people don't even show up. But the thing is, is, okay, those three days you're spending and the concept that I'm about to teach you is, is all you got to do is implement this one simple step, this one process in your financial life. And now you're able to keep all of that money in your family. You're able to recycle and recapture all of those dollars that are leaving your family. So the comment that I made was, I was like, look, you guys are all here. You're here for three days learning what to do to make more money. But how about if the only thing you did is you started to keep, all right, if all you had to do is keep the money that you already had, how much ahead would you be if you just started keeping what you already have? Instead of going out and looking for the next big deal or investment opportunity, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I'm saying this concept, this concept that we teach you, the infinite banking concept, the money multiplier method, that's what we're teaching. We're just showing you how to keep the money you already have. And when you keep the money that you already have, instead of like all that money going out and all of it going out to others and it leaves your family forever, it is a game changer in your financial life. And I don't know how many people thought about that, but it is something new that I'm going to use probably in every seminar that I speak at now. I'm going to say, look, what if we could just keep the money that you're already making? How much further ahead would you be if there's a system, a concept, and a process to get all that money back? But see, I don't think people look at it that way, Chris and Steven. I don't think that's the way they're looking at it. They're looking at it like, there's got to be more to it. It's got to be more complicated. It, it can't be that easy. 
what's the catch? You know, what's going on, right? So they're trying to overcomplicate this process that is so, so simple. And here, all of us are, are going to be on the on these webinars for the next five or six weeks, probably 90 minutes at a time. And at the end of the game, right? So I get to the end of the day, it's all about just adding one simple process in your life and taking control of your own wealth instead of giving up that control to someone else. But yeah. instead, what we have to do is we're going to spend all this time going over different examples because people don't want just the one simple step of like how to do it. They want to see all the steps and all the processes and all the different examples, right? So they kind of get hung up in trying to overanalyze everything. They overanalyze, overanalyze. Well, I got to look at it. I got to do more research. Well, a lot of people, I call it paralysis by analysis. They overanalyze everything and they never, ever get started, right? I mean, that's what we see. It happens all the time. So common. So anyway, I don't know what your question was, but um, that was my thought. <laughs> well, that thought brings up something that I just saw, you know, Everything about what you said makes all the sense in the world, you know, by you applying this one change to your financial life. And that's well, actually it. not even a change, though, right? Not a change, just one adding step. one Add step. One step. Adding one step. Right. By adding that one step, it then puts you back in control of your money without working harder, longer, or taking on additional risk. But, you know, that's going to create a big problem for people. And I got a video that I want to play. I just saw this, and it was pretty interesting because it ties into exactly what you just said about this problem. So let me play this video for every single person here because I think it's going to sum up what problem we're going to have after you're done with these five weeks of this series. So here it is. Roll. Good evening, folks. I'm Seymour Cash from MSTV Worldwide, and I'm joined here with my co-host, Anastasia Beaverhausen. And we have a breaking news story for you tonight. This story has me incredibly concerned. And there's an epidemic going on out there, folks, right now, and it's happening all around. And no one's even covering this. No one's paying attention to this epidemic. It's like hiding in the secret shadows. What's happening? It's called Fat Wallet. The wallet gains weight uncontrollably until the seams literally rip. It's initially undetectable until the damage is already done and then it's too late. The wallet must be replaced to hold all that cash. That really is unbelievable. You know, in fact, the scientists are telling us that there is a strong correlation between MSTV and the Fat Wallet. And we have a new report that shows that over 30% of our viewers are experiencing a 30% weight gain in their wallet, regardless of their spending habits. And I think this is gonna to lead to major health problems. Reports are showing hip problems, back problems, just pants problems, pants are ripping, holes oh, just out of the butts of their pants. Just Son of a bitch. This just in, Seymour Cash has checked himself into financial rehab. Thank you for tuning in to MSTV Worldwide. I mean, you might, might all not realize the problem that we're going to have if we take back all the money that we're giving away to everybody else, but that's the problem. We're going to have health concerns now we have to deal with because our wallets are going to be so fat that it's going to give us back problems. I mean, what do you have to say about that? Absolutely, man, and that's what we're doing. That That's exactly what we're doing here is we are creating more wealth for ourselves. We're keeping that money inside of our own family. There's no money being leaked out to other people. And that's, that is the true concept of what Nelson Nash laid down the foundation in his book, becoming your own banker, which we always got to give credit. Every time we talk, we got to give credit to our Nelson Nash, because I would have never learned this. I would have never known this. And then Chris, you met me several years back and you, like we're in the business, right? So you were in this business working for New York Life as a financial advisor, and they never taught you this, right? So this isn't information that the thing people can just go to the guy that sells life insurance and get this information. They don't know it. I mean, look at you, a financial advisor, a stockbroker for 14 plus years at New York Life, and you never knew it until a guy named Mike Baird said, hey, Chris, you ought to check this out. And you were like, what? That's not right. You can't do that. I'm in this business. There's no way it doesn't work that way. And then the next week you were on the plane to Port of Arda, Mexico to 
go through the master, the training class that we had, the master mine or the extended advanced training. Absolutely. So where should we start? Should we, you know, here, here's the thing. And I did this earlier on another show, but I want to kind of start with this. I want to start by asking the audience and all of you, you know, when you hear this, please comment back. I want to know if you owned your own business, I want you all to get in the mindset of being an entrepreneur and you own a business and let's just call it a restaurant. If you owned a restaurant, would you go to your restaurant and eat dinner every once in a while? Would you frequent your restaurant and eat the food at your restaurant? You would because it's your business, right? Of course you would. It's your business. You'd frequent that. Okay. Now, another one. If you owned your own hair salon, would you get your hair cut at your own place? Would you get your all your beauty stuff done? Would you get this mop of a haircut taken care of at your hair salon? Well, of course you would. You wouldn't go to the competitor to get your hair done. And then if you owned your own gym, would you work out at your gym? Would you frequent your gym that you own? Of course you would. I've never been to a gym where the owner wasn't working out at his own, his or her own gym. These are all just staples. All of you are saying, of course, duh, what? this is a stupid question. So let me pose the last question to you. If you all owned your own bank, would you make deposits in your bank? If you wanted to buy a new car or a new gym set for your garage, would you finance that gym or would you finance that car through your bank? And would you take withdrawals from your bank and do all your banking business at your bank or somebody else's? Stupid, right? Of course you would do business with your bank. The biggest question out of this whole thing is, why are you not doing this? Why are you not treating your money the same as you treat the other bank's money? Why aren't you practicing this, what we're going to teach you, this strategy, this concept of you becoming your own bank? Well, that's what you're all here to learn. You're all here to learn how to be your own bank. But there's a minor little thing we need to get over. This one step that we have to add. We can get to that. But Brent, why don't we start by just explaining to everybody how a bank actually works? Because I think a lot of people would be like, oh, my God, if I owned a bank, that'd be great. But I, they, they think they can't. Right. They can, but to understand it, we need to kind of walk them through how to actually operate their own bank. So can you just kind of walk through this slide here and yeah. tell them like, how does bank work? Yeah, absolutely. So basically the thing we have is the, the dollars that you, the depositor have, and you're going to take your money. It doesn't matter how much it is. Hang on. Let me blow this screen up. See if I can see that a little better. I don't see the number. Oh, is well, it a hundred grand on it right now? What's that? We're zooming in. Oh, okay, on it, good right? deal. There you go. Yeah. That yeah. is your deposit. That's a hundred thousand dollars you got there, right? A hundred thousand dollars. No, so now it doesn't matter what the amount of deposit is that you put into the policy, right? Or into your bank. It doesn't matter what the amount is. It could be a hundred dollars, it could be a million dollars. But the important thing to know is it's your money. It's actually your money that you're putting in. It's a little blurry. So if you can zoom out or zoom in, whatever, it's, it's coming in and out. So I'm assuming if it's coming in and out for me, it's coming in and out for everybody. So the thing that you're going to do is take your money and it's going to go, where are you doing it right now? Every time you get money in, no matter how that money comes in, it can be active income, passive income, investment income. It could be a birthday card in the mail from grandma. And what do you do with that money? You put that money into somebody else's bank. I live in Florida, so we'll call it the Bank of Florida. Um, Chris lives in New York, the Bank of New York. Wherever you bank at, Wells Fargo, Chase, U.S. Bank. That's what you do, right? I don't even know you guys, and I know that's what you do. You get money in, and you put it in to the bank of wherever you bank. Now, I'm going to say that bank is, is um, a good bank, and it's going to pay you 4% interest on the money that you put in. Now, look, I know it's not going to pay you 4% interest, all right? But we're going to say that you found a really, really good bank, and that bank's going to pay you 4% interest. Now, every time you put that money in to the bank, the bank owes you interest. So that money becomes a liability to the bank because they owe you interest, right? Well, how does the bank take your money and turn it into an asset? That's right. They loan it out. Loans are assets to banks, right? So a loan is an asset to a bank. But every time we think of a loan, guess what we think of it as? We think of it as a debt, an expense, a liability, a payment, right? 
Well, we have to start thinking the way that a bank thinks. We have to start thinking of a loan as an asset. And let's walk through that. So every time you put money into the bank, right? Now, guess what you do after you put your money in the bank? You go back to the bank and say, Mr. Banker, I want to go buy a house. So can I borrow money from you, Mr. Banker, to buy a house? Now, who on this call has ever went to a bank besides myself to buy to borrow money to buy a house? Probably all of us, most of us, right? So the thing that we do is we go to the banker. After we put our money in, the depositor, we put our money into the bank. We go back to the bank and say, Mr. Bank, I need to borrow money to buy a house. And the bank says, okay, I will lend you the money to buy the house, and I'm going to charge you 7% interest. Now, don't get hung up with the numbers. I just want you to get the concept and see where we're going. Well, if you borrow money from a bank to buy a house, are you expected to pay the bank back with interest? Absolutely you are, right? Because I know that you're not going to steal from the bank. And if and even if you didn't decide to pay them back, they're going to come and foreclose on the property, are they not? Absolutely they will. So you're going to pay the bank back with interest because you borrowed from the bank. So who's in control of that transaction? The bank. The bank's in control. Okay? So now the thing you also do is you're going to go to the bank and you want to borrow money to buy a car. Well, who on this call has went to a bank to borrow money to buy a car, just like me? You guys have probably had two, right? Or the majority of you, and maybe some of you more than one car. You go back and back and forth, back and forth, and you buy cars, and you borrow money from a bank. So now you borrow the money from the bank to buy the car. Well, in this example, the bank's going to charge you 8% interest. Again, don't get hung up on the numbers. I want you to get the concept. Well, just like the house, if you borrow money from a bank to buy a car, are you expected to pay them back with interest? Absolutely you are. So who's in control of that transaction? The bank. All right? Now, let's say you are into um, investing into real estate or the real estate world, or you might not even be into real estate, but have you ever had to do a repair on a house? Have you ever had the new, like, right? Um, so possibly, so what, you added a, 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 a um, so like a brand new kitchen, you added granite countertops, you put a swimming pool, a basement, whatever it was, you did some kind of house remodel. I've done house remodels at this house. They're telling me I might need a new roof and I have a tile roof. So you know what kind of money that's going to cost? It's going to be expensive for a tile roof. So they're saying you may need a roof because you've got a couple, a couple of leaks. Well, that would be a home remodel. What would a lot of people do? Um, even me, myself, possibly I could, right? I could go to the bank and I could borrow money to put on that tile roof. And let's just call that 9% interest that they're going to charge me. But if I borrow that money from the bank, I have to pay them back with interest. Because if I don't, my credit's going to go bad, right? They're going to foreclose on my property. I mean, who knows? Maybe they'll come take the roof off. I don't know what they do if you don't pay for a roof. But anyway, I borrowed the money from the bank, right? Now, I okay, so... So like, I want you to see what's happening here. As we're going through these, the house, the car, and the house remodel, can you notice how the depositor puts money into the bank and then the depositor borrows money out of the bank and he pays back the bank. He borrows out, pays back. So the money comes in, goes out, comes in, goes out, comes in, goes out. The money is constantly in motion, right? That's why if you ever take a $20 bill or... or, 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 or a dollar bill, a hundred dollar bill to the bank. And let's say you put your initials on this $20 bill and you highlight it in yellow and you give it to the bank teller. Well, does that bank teller take your $20 bill? Okay, so I'm going to say this is my $20 bill. I gave it to the bank teller. Does the bank teller take my $20 bill? And so did they take it to the back room of the bank and there's a little box there that says Brent Kessler? And that's where they put my $20. No, they don't do that. As a matter of fact, if I wanted to get this $20 bill back out of the bank in a month, the same one that I have initial and highlighted, are they going to give me the same one back? No. What about in a week, a day, an hour? They're not going to give me the same $20 bill back. Why aren't they going to give me the same one back? Because they're moving it. It's constantly in motion. Money is moving in, moving out, moving in, moving out, right? So that's why that $20 bill is never there, that same $20 bill.
because the money's in motion. So that's all banks are doing is they're keeping money in motion. It's coming in, going out, coming in, going out. So now we're going to do a debt consolidation loan. The last one there in Chris's um, example, we're going to do a debt consolidation loan and we're going to say we're going to pay off all the credit cards and we'll call that 12% interest. So now we pay off the credit cards and that money has to go back in the banking system, does it not? So tell me what happened there with all of those transactions. Who's in control of every one of those transactions? The house, the car, the home remodel, and the debt consolidation. It's the bank. The bank is in total control of what's going on, right? Now, let's do a little math here and see how well you did and how well the bank did. Now, remember, I said you found a really, really good bank that's going to pay you 4% interest on your money. I know you're not, but I'm just going to make believe you found a good one. So the bank is paying you 4%. So the thing you do is you put money in the bank, the bank's going to pay you four. And then either you or somebody else goes to the bank and says, hey, Mr. Banker, I want to buy a house. And they're going to take out the house loan at 7%. So what just happened? The bank made seven and you made four. So how much more did the bank make than you? Well, if they made seven and you made four, they made 3% more than you, did they not? That's right. So now let's go to the house example or, 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 or the car example. The bank made eight and you made four. So if the bank made eight and you made four, how much more did they make than you? 4%. So they made eight, you made four. So they made 4% more than you. Because remember, all banks are doing is they're using that money over and over and over again. They're recycling that money. So now the home remodel. The bank made nine and you made four. So how much more? Nine minus four is five. So the bank made 5% more than you on the home remodel. And then finally, on the debt consolidation, the bank made 12 and you made 4. So 12 minus 4 is 8%. So the bank made 8% on the house remodel. So let's look at all of the transactions combined, because all banks do is they move money in and move it out. So they do this over and over and over and over again. So how much did the bank make? Well, 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 8. The bank made 20%, didn't they? The bank made 20% on the money that you put in there. And how much did you make? You made 4%. Well, the bank made 20 and you made four. So my question is, how much more did the bank make than you? Well, 20 minus four, most people say 16%, right? Well, that's close, but is that accurate? No, the real number is 500%. Because look, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, if you made, okay, so like if you made $4 or 4% and the bank made $20 or 20%, didn't they make five times the amount of money that you made? That's right. So they made 500%. So look, this is real. Banks are making between 400 and 1300% annually on the money that you leave there each and every year. Now, I know you're sitting here thinking, all right, Brent, I hear you flapping your gums and moving your lips. How do I really know that's true, that banks make that much money on the money that I leave there? Well, what you can do is you can go and you can Google something or look up something called BauerFinancial.com. Bauer, B-A-U-E-R, BauerFinancial.com. You can look up any bank that you want. It could be a big bank that we all know the name of, right? All those big name banks, or it could be a little small town podunk bank in your small city that nobody's ever heard of. Well, all you need to do is get the annual report from that bank and the bank will have the annual report, right? Go to that website. You can find the bank. They'll have the annual report. And on that annual report, you will see banks make no less than 400% annually on the money that you leave there. So I don't care if you get the annual report from last year, this year, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you will see they make no less than 400%. Now I travel around the country and I speak on this concept or do webinars, Zoom meetings or whatever. And I go over this on almost every one of my presentations. And here's what I always ask you, the audience, the listeners. I always ask you to go do this exercise and find me a bank that makes less than 400% annually on your money. Go find one. I've never had anybody show me one yet, but if you find one, you might be the first. And if you guys think about this, it makes sense, does it not? Because I don't care what town you live in. 
You could live in a small town or a big town. And we could get in the car. We could drive down the road. We could drive down the main section of town. And we get to the stoplight or a major intersection. And there's four corners on that major intersection, right? Tell me what at least one building is that you see on one of those corners. It's a bank, is it not? Always. Are are the banks on the rundown property, bad location, bad landscaping, bad architecture, or are they the nicest buildings in town? They are the nicest buildings in town. And every time, and, and anyway, okay, so the banks are everywhere. And so when you walk in the bank, the banks are nice. All right, they're all... Okay, like all nice inside. The people look good and smell good. As a matter of fact, there's some banks that even give you things, don't they, when you go in? Have you ever went in the bank and they give you coffee and soda and teas and cookies? And sometimes they give you other stuff as well. Suckers. Right? They give you suckers. <laughs> That's right. So actually, there's a, okay, so there's a bank in our town that, okay, so there's a bank in our town that, like, if you go in there, just on a certain day of the week, they even give you wine. That's right. You go into the bank and they give you wine. Guess what day that my wife goes to the bank three or four times a day? <laughs> That's right, wine day. So they're everywhere. Banks are everywhere. Have you ever driven down the road and you're like, oh man, look, a new building is coming up. I wonder what that's going to be. Is it going to be a new restaurant, a new specialty store? You drive by there two weeks later, and what is it? It's another damn bank. So they're everywhere. So, Chris, can you go back to that screen with, with, with all the banks on it, or no? Is that gone? It's gone, but I'll get it back. So I just want to point out one thing on that screen. So, okay, so basically the thing that we said is, is basically, so who's in control of, of all of those transactions? And we said the bank. Now, here's a big question for you. How much risk did the bank take to do all of these transactions? How much risk did they take? They really didn't take a lot because whose money did they use? They used your money, the depositor's money. So they really didn't take a lot of risk. Now, I will agree that interest rate offsets risk. And as you see those numbers there, all the interest rates are going up, aren't they? Four, seven, eight, nine, 12. So the interest rate offsets the risk for the bank. So the higher of a risk that you are as a borrower, the higher interest rate the bank is going to charge you to take a loan. But if you're too high of a risk, is the bank going to loan you the money anyway no so all we want you to do is become the banker in your own life that's it we want you to continue to do what you're doing and again it doesn't matter if we want you to do it or not you're still going to do it you're still going to buy houses you're going to buy cars you're going to do house remodels you're going to use credit cards you're doing it in life anyway Who in the hell is getting all of your money? Where is all of your money going to? To someone else, to the banker. So you need to be the banker in your own life. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're teaching you to do through this one simple concept. By adding this stupid whole life insurance policy in a mutual company that pays dividends, that's specifically designed and specially engineered for high immediate cash value, all we're doing is adding one step in your life and now you become the banker. And it's not an all or none, folks. It's not like, oh, I got to have all this money in my policy to be able to make this work. No, just start wherever you want to start with. I mean, right? So there's clients that start at 150 bucks a month. And there's clients that put in about $4 million a year. You pick a number in between there, whatever (laughs) works for you, right? It doesn't matter where you start. It's not an all or none. Some people think that, oh, well, I got to get all this money in the policy and then I can do this. No, no, just do it in bits and chunks, right? Any presentation that I've presented or Chris has presented where we go over the money multiplier map, okay, so like the guy doesn't pay off all the debt in one lump sum at the first month of the first year. 
It takes time, right? How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You don't need it all in one big swallow. So wherever you're at, you start where you're at. You just start exactly where you're at and you build from there. But you've got to start. You've got to get in the pool if you want to learn how to swim. You're not going to learn how to swim by sitting in the, right on the pool deck or sitting up on the damn beach watching them swim. But it's okay. Don't jump into the deep end. Don't go dive into the ocean. Put on your floaties. Get in the baby pool and start wading around and see what it feels like to get a little wet. You have to start. It doesn't matter where you start. Everybody starts at a different place. It doesn't matter where you're at financially. You might make $10 an hour or you may make, make $10,000 an hour. It, does not make, it doesn't make a difference. The important thing is to start. And a lot of you guys probably already have these policies and you're not even using them. You don't even know you have this. It's kind of like having the Corvette in the garage, but you don't know where in the hell the keys are, right? A lot of you probably already have these types of policies to create your own banking system, whether you use us or whether you don't. I don't know. So, you know, we teach this all over the country, you know, speaking and virtually through this and many other sources, but a lot of people get hung up because this is so different than what everybody's used to, Brent. It's, uh, you know, it sounds so simple. We make it sound so easy. Just add one step, just set up this specially designed and engineered whole life. But a lot of people, you know, are just looking for quick fixes, right? When they're hungry, they drive through McDonald's, quick fix. You know, when they, when they want something, everything's just boom, you just do this, you go get a pill and it's all taken care of. But there's a little bit more to this than just opening up a whole life policy. And a lot of people, when they hear that swear word, whole life, oh my gosh, Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman all say that that's a terrible place to put your money. The, the fees in that and the commissions on that whole life, oh my gosh, that would, whoever told you that, that's a scam. And they're just trying to make a whole bunch of money on you. But people don't quite understand a few things. First off, it's not the silver bullet. The whole life is not the one and only thing that we use. And besides that whole life is not a normal whole life. It's not the whole life, as you say, that your broke ass brother-in-law sold you. This is specially designed and engineered. But a lot of people, when they hear the word, they think that there's only one type of whole life. They think there's only one way a whole life can be built. And that's when you go to the insurance store, go to your agent, go to your advisor and say, hey, I want a whole life. And they think that's it. And then they get the illustration, Brent, from their regular advisor. Because listen, a lot of people, Brent, don't even know that this is what we do. When people want to set up one of these banking policies and start the infinite banking concept, they, they're like, well, I, who do I go to? How many times do we hear on calls or on these things where people are like, well, this sounds great. Like, who do I call? Well, I don't know, man. You must, you just call the Ghostbusters, I suppose. But like, this is what we do. This is all we do at the Money Multiplier is specially designed and engineer the machine, which is nothing more than a specially designed and engineered whole life. But unfortunately, when they get the whole life from their agent, because that's who their relationship's with, so they're like, oh, I'm going to go to my financial advisor and ask him about this. Their advisor's excited. Oh, yeah, I can, I can set you up with a whole life that'll do that. Sure. They get the illustration, and they're looking at it, and they're like, um, <laughs> whew, that doesn't no look like what they just year. explained. Yeah, there's no money in the first year. There's no money in the second year. They could put a million dollars into the policy. And how much money is in the first year? How much money do they have available in the first year? That's right. Zero. How much money in the second year, Brent? In a regular off-the-shelf whole life? Zero or very little. In the third year, hardly anything. Not much so, more. So when they see that, they instantly say, oh, that infinite banking thing that they were talking about, that's a scam. It doesn't work the way they explained it. Because they literally think that Every single whole life is the same. They don't believe that it can be designed and engineered to actually do what we do. But a lot of people like also, I guess, go to the car dealership and they look at the Ford Focus on the lot and they say, oh, that's a Ford Focus. I guess that's the only kind. But then they're on, they're on their YouTube watching rally racing and they're like, wait, did that guy just go around that turn at 130 miles an hour in a Ford Focus? Of course he did. Are they the same cars? No. They, well, they are. They're both Ford Focuses, but the one was specially designed and engineered to go 130 miles an hour around a turn in full control. The other one, well, if it gets to zero to 60 in under 30 minutes, I think you got yourself a good Ford Focus. 
Just saying. They're the same car, but the design and engineering is completely different. This is what we do. We design and engineer yep. these machines, mm -hmm. i.e. specially designed and engineered whole lives to do this. But that is where so many people stop. They're like, great, I got this whole life. Well, you know, and they think that's going to solve all their problems. Oh, that whole life is going to pay off all my debts and do everything else. But they, they don't understand that it's not just the whole life. It's the process that we apply while using this machine. And I'd like for you to just take a moment and really explain to the almost, you know, 150 people on here exactly what this process is. What is the infinite banking concept that our Nelson Nash pioneered way back when? And how does that work with this specially designed and engineered whole life? Because this is what people understand, the whole life. This yeah. stuff over here is kind of like, that's what we just showed on the bank, but they can't connect the dots. And that's what we got to do. Yep, got it. A couple comments I want to make on what you just said. You're exactly right. I did client calls um, so this morning, some right. So from a brand new client calls from the events that I spoke at, and you know, I set up the strategy calls like we do with people. And I got on with one lady, and she said, "Man, this is awesome." She says, "She says I want to do this, but I've been out researching and looking um, to see who I can do this with, who can d design me one of these policies, right?" And I'm like. Um, Right. So anyway, her name was Ivy. And I said, Ivy, I said, this is what we do. This is exactly what we do. This is the only way that I get paid, Ivy, is if you start the policy with us. Right. This is what we do. No, you're not going to give me the money for the policy. We are your servicing agent um, on the policy. Right. So you're going to start the policy with us. So if this is something you want to do, I'm going to get you approved for that policy. And then we're going to work with um, probably like either one of four or five insurance companies that we work with. And we're going to design this policy for you, this specially designed, specifically engineered policy. But she was out there after she heard the information, which was like 10 days ago. She was out there going and looking about who can she start this type of policy with. So even if your agent tells you that they know about the infinite banking concept, they really don't. They really don't. And if you really, really want to see if they know and understand it, ask them these three questions. Ask them to show you how you can borrow at a higher rate than what you're earning all day long and make money. Ask them to show you how you're going to get all the money back for every car you're going to buy, drive, and own. So not only do you buy the car, you get the money back. And if you can do that with a car, can you do it with any product or service that you buy? Recycling and recapturing the money. And ask them to create you your own money multiplier map with your debts, your expenses, your investments, all of your overhead in it. Ask them to create that map for you and go over it. They don't know how to do that. So they're not going to even know how to do it. But let's just say they know how to do all of that stuff. Well, even though that they know, they don't want you to buy one of these types of policies. The reason they don't want you to buy one of these types of policies is because they have to take a commission hit, a big commission hit, 60 to 90%. That's right, 60 to 90%, a 60 to 90% hit in their commission, and they're not willing to do it. They're not willing to take that hit. So even if you find someone, they're not going to take the hit in the commission. So this is all we do at the Money Multiplier. We are 100% whole life policies in mutual companies that pay dividends, and we design them for that high immediate cash value. And the definition of immediate is within the first month, within the first 30 days. Now, we always tell you 30 days, but does it ever take you 30 days to get a loan? Never. Look, I have 19 of these policies. My oldest policy will be 14 years old in March. I've never had to wait more than 12 days to get a policy loan. And if you really wanted a policy loan in a day or two, you could get it. And you just had to have it overnight to you. You may have to pay an overnight express fee, but you could get it. But I tell you 30 days because if it doesn't show up in 30, I don't want you to be mad. Absolutely. So anyway, Chris, I just wanted to kind of um, just go in that and elaborate on that because I want the listeners to know that yes, we get on and teach this stuff, but yes, hopefully if you like what you see and you're gonna implement this in your life, 
you're going to do it with us, with me or Chris or Steven or Gabby, someone on the money multiplier team, because this is what we do, right? This is what we do. All the content, all the servicing we provide you, you don't ever pay us a dime. You never write us a check for a dime. You don't write Brent Kessler, Chris Noggle, Stephen Nagy, the money multiplier. You don't write us a check for a dime. As a matter of fact, the way that we all get paid is one way. We get paid the same way your car insurance guy or gal gets paid. We get paid a commission on the policy that you start. So if you go to John Smith, the Allstate man to buy car insurance, the check that you write is not to John Smith. You write it to Allstate and Allstate pays John Smith a commission. So who do you want to work with? Because no matter who you do a policy with, no matter who it is, somebody's going to get paid a commission. So are you wanting to work with someone that doesn't know about this? Or do you want to work with someone that this is all we do? This is all we do. A hundred percent. We eat, live, and breathe this stuff. All right. So one of the things that, you know, we, we've kind of now figured it out just to kind of hit some of those things. This is not a normal hype, whole life. It is a specially designed and engineered whole life. In order to do this, the agent, the advisor who actually builds and designs this policy has to take a reduction in their commission of 60 to 90 percent. They're not going to like that. And then that 60 to 90 percent, because they reduce their commission, allows immediate cash value to be used in this whole life policy in the first 30 days. So those are the most important things. But there's some other reasons why people would want to use this that we really didn't hit. That's just the design. A couple other things is first, it's guaranteed. So there's a guaranteed interest rate that you're going to earn on it. Plus, every single year, these mutually owned insurance companies, because they're not stock owned or you know they're not publicly traded companies, they share in the profits or the unused premiums that were paid into the company in the form of a dividend. But because they're returning unused premiums, the dividends and the way that the interest is calculated, because it is quote unquote insurance, life insurance under the IRS code, all of the money grows tax free. And for anyone that's ever read the book, uh, Power of Zero, he talks about this a lot because we want to move money from taxable buckets to tax free buckets. Then we want to move money from tax deferred buckets to tax free buckets. It only makes sense that we should just put our money in a place where it's tax free. Well, conveniently, this is tax free. And the other nice thing is it's protected against judgments and liens in most states. So, you know, hey, let's look at OJ Simpson. You know, the dude's still a millionaire. How many times did he get sued? I wonder where his money was. Yeah, there's a lot of examples like that. It's protected in most states. But the other thing, too, that I think we never talk about is the one thing that I now that I have a 16 or 17 month old now is the legacy play. When we're gone from this earth, Brent, when me and you are gone and we graduate and go on to a better place, whatever your belief is, is where we go, that day will happen. Your bank account, your 401k and all that stuff, sure, it goes to your heirs. Some of those assets are passing through probate, which is not fun, but not these. These specially designed and engineered whole lives that were designed for what we're going to show you next, the infinite banking concept, also provide a legacy that will be paid out tax-free to your beneficiaries your wife, your husband, your children, tax-free, and it bypasses probate. There is no probate. The insurance company just says, hey, listen, what day did your, your loved one pass away? And we're very sorry to hear about the loss. Can you give us a death certificate and fill out this one or two page form? And we will make sure that a check makes it to you immediately to take care of whatever needs you have. Does the bank do that? When your traditional bank, you know, when you die or you graduate, does your traditional bank just you know, rush to make sure that your family gets the money? No, 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 no. Well, there's probate. Oh, and there's forms and there's tax forms. Well, we can't just give you the money. It's going to be locked up for how long? Well, that depends on your circumstances, but not here. This legacy goes direct to your family. We never talk about that, Brent, but it is important, although it is not the sole reason because that's what you buy regular life insurance for. This, the, the legacy would be a secondary. So now that we know all the benefits, this is why the wealthy use this tax-free growth, the ability to put money into this, earn a guaranteed interest rate plus dividends, the ability to not only put money into it and store their capital and their wealth, but then take the money out and use it 
And we just went over how a bank moves money. They don't just put it in the back. Heck, they don't leave that money sit, like you said, for even an hour. So the bank is a master of moving money. And this is one of the laws of wealth. So first law of wealth is you got to save and keep money, which is what I'm talking about up here, right? So we already got all this stuff. So I'll get rid of all that. We got, we make money and we spend most of it today, but what you should be doing is keeping and saving at least one tenth or more of your money. And once you do that, that money has to go somewhere. And where are you putting it today? I'll bet you most of you are putting it in 401ks, bank accounts. And then once you put it in the bank account, what are you doing? You're just letting it sit there. You are violating Law number two of wealth, which is we have to move our money. Our money has to work for us. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to then, in the first 30 days or whatever is appropriate for your situation, we're going to move that money. And that money's got to go to work, just like you and I have to go to work. And that money has to earn a higher interest rate or work harder than what the cost is. And what is the cost? This is where people get hung up, Brent. They're like, yeah, but if I take that money, I'm taking a loan from that whole life. Isn't it a loan, Chris? Because loans aren't good, they're, they're debt. Yeah, but when you take a loan, the insurance company is giving you a loan against your debt benefit, which is how the legacy is provided. So because they give a loan against your debt benefit, the insurance company, as far as I know, Brent, never, ever, 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 ever asks you for that loan back until the day you die. You can always pay it back, which would give you more liquidity and more ability to move the money. But if you don't pay the loan back, does the insurance company ever send you a warning letter? Does the insurance company ever like start harping on you to say, hey, listen, Mr. Noggle, you've had this loan out for three years and you've never paid it back. We want our money. Do they ask for that? Never. Never. Because it's against your death benefit. So for the insurance company, they don't care. The money just gets queued up the day you graduate and go to heaven or wherever you go. That money is just taken from the death benefit. So when we take loans, the loans are against their death benefit, which means any money that we've saved or kept just stays in our policy, which is a pretty cool concept because this allows us to tap into the one thing that I think is the single most powerful thing in the financial world, and that is called compound interest, but more specifically, uninterrupted compound interest. In other words, folks, if you save money, I want you to envision your bank because you guys can all wrap your head around the bank, your someone else's bank. You go in there with your money and you're like, all right, Mr. Banker, can you put this in my account? Great. Take your dumb, dumb sucker and you're out the door. You go back a year later and you're like, hey, I want to take that money out. And the bank says, no problem. And they get, well, they don't always just say no problem, but let's just pretend that the bank just gives you all your money back without any forms or any questions. Usually they say, well, what are you taking the money out for? Is that any of your damn business? It's my money. Not really. When you gave the deposit over to the traditional bank, you gave up control of your money to the bank. So it's really not your money, but let's just pretend that they give you it all back easily. Imagine if the bank teller said to you, Mr. Noggle, I got good news for you today. We're going to give you all your money back like you requested, but we're going to continue to keep paying you interest. And we're going to give you dividends on all of the money, even though you just took it all back out. You would think you just graduated and went to heaven just a wee bit early, wouldn't you? But with an insurance company, that's exactly what happens because the insurance company has all the money. They're just going to give you part of your death benefit. And now what we get to do is we get to move that loan, that money, and make it go work for us. But, oh, there's a catch, Chris. I know there's a catch. So, yeah, I got it. I don't have to pay the loan back. Where's the catch? Well, the catch is the insurance company doesn't do this for free. They do charge you interest on that money in the tune of 5%. by Well, actually, that's going to change in a couple of days, but let's just use the old number of 5%. Yeah, and however, it's going down. It's going to yes, be going it, oh, down. Yeah, that's good news. It's going down. So does anyone like when your loan interest rate goes up? No. Does anyone like when their loan interest rate goes down? Yep. Well, that just happened. And I can't give you the numbers because I don't know what it's going to go down to, but you know, I just put between 4 and 5%. So that's what they're going to charge you. Simple interest on your loan. Now, play with me here for a second. So if you're paying, let's just use the 5%. And with dividends, let's just assume under to this year, you're making 6% on your money with dividends. So what would the math be if you were making six and paying five? You'd be making a spread like the bank, right? Remember the bank gave you four and charged seven, you're making a spread of roughly one here, aren't you? But if the, if the interest rate was lower, let's just say four or 3%, but the amount you're earning was the same, didn't your spread just go up? Sure did. Folks, good news. 
Breaking news, that just happened. So your spread went up. So now we're able to make this spread on our money while taking our money out and sending it to work. And we're gonna cover that because is it 100% that you can take out immediately from your policy? No, but it can be between 60. And I mean, we've been doing some that are 95% in the first year. So you could access 60 to 95% of whatever you decided to put through this specially designed whole life. But Brent, this is the part where I think people really need to wrap their head around how this works because we've got it all here. We understand the spread. We understand the benefits of why the wealthy use this. And, and now what the most important thing is, is where are we going to make this money go to work? Do you want to hit this real quick? And I'll just kind of pencil it out on the screen. Like if we got this money, it's right now probably sitting in somebody else's bank or somebody else's account that you're not in control. And now we change and add that one step. And now that money's sitting in our bank, which is a specially designed whole life. And we move it. Where do we move it to? What are some things we can do with this money? So, um, yeah. So anyway, okay. So a couple points I want to make sure that, okay, that we're clear on. Remember that whenever you take a loan, it's not your money that you're borrowing out from the policy. You're simply putting your policy up for collateral and you're taking a loan from the general fund of the insurance company. And remember, the insurance company can never ever lose because your death benefit amount is always going to be higher than the loan available or the cash available. So it's not an if you die, pass or graduate, it's going to be a when. And at the time of your death, what happens is that death benefit is now going to pay off any outstanding loans. Because remember, while you were living, they already gave you that money. And the additional money that's left over is going to go to your beneficiaries tax-free. So the way to look at this is you're simply borrowing against your death benefit. You're using your money while you're living, where most people, when they set up these policies, they set it up for the next future generations. Here, you're doing both. You're are able to use the money while you're living and it's continuing to grow. The, all right, as Chris says, there's no interruption of compound interest. That money is continuing to grow tax-free in that tax-free environment. Now, another point of that is remember when you put dollars into the policy, when you pay premium, the dollars you put into the policy are with after-tax dollars, which is a great thing which is a great thing because the thing you want to do is pay tax on your money one time, one time only at the lowest rate possible. And the thing you want to get your money into a tax-free environment where it's growing tax-free and you want the government completely out of your hair and you want to be in control. So just hey, a couple also, things I want to. One thing I want to bring up on that and uh, Jim pull, pulled up a good comment. We never bring this up. So some people look at 6% and they're like, I'm making way more. And I know we're going to cover that, but they're like, oh, I'm making way more than that in the stock market. I'm making way more in my Bitcoin and Ethereum or, or in real estate. But this is tax-free. So 6% with dividend tax-free. I mean, what would that equate to if you had to pay taxes on that money? Like what would the after-tax yield equivalent be to 6%? And that depends well, on your I mean tax rate, right? The thing, yeah, it does. So like, let's just say if you're in a, for example, a 30% tax bracket, well, there you go. It would be an extra 30%, would it not? Yeah. So, I mean, what's 30% of 6%, you know? I mean, like a couple be, percent, you know? Could it be seven and a half percent? I mean, that's your after tax equivalent yield because this money is growing tax free and we never bring that up. So thanks, Jim, for bringing that up because- that's a thing that we never really talk about. And a lot of people are like, oh, 6%, that's nothing. You just, 6% not nothing. Like you just think that because you're in this fantasy world of believing that these returns that you're making in the stock market and crypto are actually going to be around forever and they will not be. But this return will be because this return, if you remember, is guaranteed, not all six, but the guaranteed amount, depending on your policy design, is guaranteed. And then the dividend is not. Well, but let's just talk about the dividend, even though the dividend is not guaranteed, because anybody that has a policy and a policy illustrations, okay, so they know there's two sides of the column, there's the guaranteed column, and the non guaranteed column. Well, the guaranteed side 
is the worst that the policy can ever perform. That's the absolute worst. But even the guaranteed side looks pretty good, right? But that's the worst that it could perform. Now, there's kind of a joke that we have in the whole life industry. And the thing that we say is the guaranteed side is guaranteed to never be the guaranteed number. <laughs> it's always going to be a number higher because of the dividend. Now, the dividend is not guaranteed. However, every company that we work with, and I'll have Hannah correct me if I'm wrong, every company that we work with has been paying dividends for over 122 consecutive years without fail. Every single year without fail. And remember, every year the insurance company declares a dividend. Once that dividend is declared, it can never be retracted. It can never be taken back. So I will tell you, I have 19 policies, right? And, and I've been doing this now since my first policy was in February of 2008. So in February, it'll be what? It'll, um, let's see, it'll be 13 years old or no, 14 years old, be 14 years old in February. And I can take my policy illustrations and I could get every year, I get an in-force illustration. So I see how that policy performed. There's been some years where it's performed a bit less than expected, and there's been years that it's performed better than expected. But when you throw it all in the wash, it comes out almost spot on. These actuaries have these numbers dialed in. They have them dialed in pretty good. So yeah, it may not perform as expected, but it can perform more than expected. So don't chase dividends. A lot of you guys will call up and you'll say, oh, I want the company with the best dividend. No, you don't, because the company that has the best dividend this year may not have it next year. Every company that we work with, every single company we work with, I'm not married to any of them. If you call me up and say, Brent, I want a policy with XYZ company. Well, if that's a company that we work with, then we can help you with that, right? So, but I'm not going to tell you necessarily that that's a better company because I don't, I think all the companies are equal. Now, there's some companies that are better based on your age, the state you live in, the health that you're in. And there's some companies that are a little worse based on those situations. But it's not about the company. You cannot, cannot, cannot chase dividends. You got to get the concept. You're putting the concept into play. So, and, and, and again, I want to stress that don't chase the company. Yes, there's, there are companies that we work with that everybody knows the name of the company. You see it on TV or you go to the baseball or the football stadium and there's a big billboard that has their name on it. Is that necessarily the best company? No. As a matter of fact, sometimes that company sucks for certain things, right? But it's the one you know about. Every company, guys, that we've been using has been around for almost a couple hundred years or so, like right? So over 120 plus years because they've all been paying dividends for 120 plus consecutive years. So just because it's not always the big name company, go look them up. You can go research the companies, look at their Comdex score, look at their, okay, so go look at their rating. Go Google the best insurance companies to practice the infinite banking concept. It's not about the company necessarily. It's about how the policy is designed and how you use the policy. It's how you use the policy because nobody has ever lost money in a whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends. It's never happened. Go look it up and find it. The only risk factor with doing this is you and how you use the policy. So you are the risk factor. So who do you know better than you? Right. And, and I love that because, you know, so far up to this point, all we've really done is just talk about the whole life. And, you know, if I read the, the chats that are coming in and I'm intentionally not answering any of them. So if you're chatting in, we will get to them if you put it in the Q and a, but a lot of the questions are like, you know, about the 6% and about this and that all about the whole life. To be quite honest, once you get down this rabbit hole, like Brent, myself and Steven are, where you're using this, we could give two shits about that because it's not that that matters. It's what we're going to get into next, which is how we actually make our money go work. The only reason we use this stupid whole life, and I'm, I'm saying it, you know, hey, Dave Ramsey, these stupid whole life policies is because it is the only vehicle that we have found that allows us to earn uninterrupted compound interest on every dollar of our money and still use that money. 
tax-free with a legacy, you know, protected against judgments and liens in most states. I mean, you tell me anywhere else you can put your money that gives me all those. Brent and I will sit down for about what? About 30 seconds, I think is what it would take. And we will then change all of our trainings. We will change all of our material to then use the machine that you told us can do all those things better than this stupid whole life can. But everybody just wants to focus on, oh, the 6% and oh, the loan interest rate. Can the loan interest rate change? Can this change? Let's get into the good stuff of yeah. where your wealth is really built. Because if you think you're going to get wealthy making 6%, even if it's tax-free, I'm sorry, folks, that's just going to take you way too long. And you should probably just get off of this training right now. Because now what we're going to talk about is where the real rubber meets the road, where the yep. real wealth is built. And that is through the infinite banking concept. You already saw this, but everybody already forgot about what we just showed you with a bank. Remember, if you yeah. owned a bank, we already decided that you would then deposit money in your bank. You would take loans from your bank. You even said to yourself, of course, I would pay my bank back with interest because you it's your bank. You need to treat this like you treat the bank's money. You never, ever do not pay the bank back with interest. And if you don't, you get yourself in trouble. Your credit score gets hit. So just because it's your bank, not their bank, what, now you're going to steal from your bank? No. You are going to treat your bank the same as you treat their bank. And right now, I have to guess that most of you are using someone else's bank for your credit cards. And I have to guess that you're making monthly payments to someone else's bank for those credit cards. And I'd have to guess that that credit card is charging some kind of interest in the form of an, a high interest rate on those credit cards, right or right. Okay. I have to assume that most of you drive a car. This is the United States of of America, the land of opportunity. So you all probably have a car. And I have to believe that most of you are either leasing or financing the car. And that means you're making a monthly payment to someone else's bank and you're paying somebody else's bank an interest rate. Even if you're leasing, there's interest baked into that. And I'm assuming that most of you have a cell phone. And I bet you any money, a lot of you go to Apple, Samsung, or whatever store you go to and you finance your cell phone because you don't want to spend the, what was it, $1,300 for the iPhone 13. I mean, that's just, that's just idiotic. But so you're just like, oh, this increased my monthly payment by 60 bucks and I get my new phone. So we're just going to use that. And that's monthly. And some and some don't, but they probably are charging you some form of interest rate, even if it's 0%. And I know you guys are laughing about that. And most of you have financed other things in your life that you're paying someone else's bank a monthly payment for with interest. Is this a false statement or a true statement for all of you? It's true. So how much money every single month you give away to somebody else's bank? Well, let's just put some dollars to this, right? Let's just assume that some of you are, are driving a car that's $500 a month, and let's just use 5% interest on that, okay? Just making numbers up here. And let's just assume that some of you have credit cards, and let's say you're paying $200 a month at 20% interest to the credit card company. Some are higher, some are lower. And let's assume your cell phone is $60 a month and you're paying, I don't know, I'll be nice and just say 2%. And let's say you bought some exercise equipment during COVID and then exercise equipment, they're charging you 150 bucks a month at 4% interest. All of these represent your money, the money that, remember we said your income comes in and how some of your income you spend and some of your income you keep. You do not keep all your income like you think. You give it away. I'm showing you. This is money you're giving away. You're not keeping that. The money you're keeping, we've already decided, is going to go into this stupid whole life that this guy, Chris and Brent, are teaching you about. But look at all the money you're bleeding every month. And I'm not even getting into the good stuff. All that money's leaving your family. So what if all we did is we just said, all right, listen, we're going to use our bank to then pay off their bank. But then we're going to treat our money the same way we treat their money, and we're going to pay ourselves back. And this is where Dave Ramsey would be proud of us, Brent, because we're going to use his methodology, his baby steps. We're going to snowball the debts. We're going to start with the lowest debt, put that in order with our mapping team, number one, number two, number three, the lowest balance to the highest balance. So let's just assume four and five. And then what we're going to do is we're going to pay all these off one at a time. So we start with paying off the cell phone. So the how that works is remember we're going to take a loan from our bank and we're going to pay off their bank that's all we're doing so we paid off the cell phone balance 
and we were giving the cell phone company $60. Let's just do some math. Somebody else can do the math on this. We got $60 that we were giving away to Apple every month, but we paid Apple off with our bank. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that $60 and we're then gonna recapture and recycle that money into our bank. Did you have to work any harder to do that? Nope. Did you have to take on any risk? Uh, nope. And did you have to go out there and do anything different than you're doing today? No. Well, there actually is one thing you had to do. You had to go into your bank account and you had to change the bill pay from Apple to you. How much more fun would it be to actually write checks every month to yourself versus everybody else? I can tell you from experience, that shit's fun. Okay, that's all I gotta say. So now we're gonna keep going. So once we do that, we got $60 a month coming back over here. Now all of a sudden we got 60 plus what money we're keeping and we're just gonna keep repeating this process. But next we're gonna pay off the second one. And then we're gonna recapture $150 a month right there. Plus remember, we're not just recapturing the money, we're recapturing the interest rate that you were giving away, the two, the four, and see, then we're gonna go right down the line. And we're gonna take back and pay off the credit cards with all this extra money that we were doing and another loan from our policy. And we're, then we're gonna pay off our car with another loan and that's $500. So if we were to add all this up, if somebody hasn't done it, 200 plus 150, that's 350, okay? Plus 500, so you guys are doing the math. How much money does that add up to every single month that now is going back to your bank? And then not only that, how much interest did you take back? 20% here, five here, two there, four there. If we were to average that out, is that more than what you were making in that stupid whole life? Oh yeah. But see, here's the best part. It doesn't matter that it's more or less because you're making money twice. This isn't a zero sum game. It's not an and or game as our buddy Caleb says. It's the, it's the, this is the and asset. You're making money here and here twice without working any harder or any longer get, taking on any risk. Like how is this hard to understand? It's hard to understand because you've been lied to, literally lied to your entire life about how money works. You've been taught to work for it, trade hours for dollars. Then you've been taught to go spend it all and give it all to somebody else's bank. And you wonder why the wealthy keep getting wealthier and it's hard for you to get off the financial hamster wheel because you're living in financial slavery. It's what you've been taught to live, folks. And you guys just don't think about it. Wake up and understand this is such a simple, simple change in your life. Like Brent says, you had one step. Yep. You, add, not, you just add one step and that is change where your money goes first and then just do the same damn thing you're doing now, except for change the name on the damn check and write your name on it. Your name is actually the insurance company's name, but it all ends up back in your bank. Listen, I just drew a circle and on the left side of the circle is your bank. On the right side are all the things that right now you're paying other people for. We just take all the money you're paying everybody else and we move it back into your bank. And the whole time, the dumb insurance company, and I'm joking around, they're not dumb at all, but we're just going to pretend here. The dumb insurance company never stopped paying you interest on your money. Are they stupid? That's key. That's, that's so key. I was, I'm glad you just mentioned that because I'm chomping at the bit to jump in and say <laughs> that is key because the money right, you, you put into the policy. You have taught me so well. You have taught me so well. I would never miss that. The whole time, the dumb insurance company never stopped paying you interest on your money. Like, uninterrupted compound interest. So your money never, ever, ever left your policy. All those transactions Chris just showed you, the money never came out of the policy. It's still growing inside of that policy, growing at that guaranteed tax-free growth rate. And what's the coolest thing about it is, is the damn government's completely out of your hair oh, yeah, because you've already paid tax on the money. All that money you put in there, when you put it into the policy, you have already paid tax on that money. And when you take out a policy loan, a loan is never, ever taxable, is it? You've never paid tax on a loan. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you could, right? So, like, you could, so anyway, it could actually create a tax advantage, a tax benefit, because if you could borrow the money out for a business purpose, you could essentially write off the interest that you paid for that policy loan. Now, I'm not a CPA, a financial advisor, you know, or um, like or your tax man. So check with that. But let me just tell you, if you are borrowing from your policy and you're going to use it for a business purpose and you're um and just like either your CPA, accountant, tax professional says, no, 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 you can't write off the interest, then I would be looking for a new tax professional. Yeah, so Brent, you know, I want to, and I know we're doing a five-part series here, and I really today just wanted to kind of 
hit some of the things that just get me. Like you already agreed about the businesses, the gym, the hair salon, the restaurant, you'd, you'd frequent and use your business for the things that you need because it's your business. But yet, if you owned your own bank, why would you violate those same rules that you would just told me you would do? Why would you bank with somebody else? If you owned the bank, you wouldn't see how simple this is when you actually put it into that perspective. It's not what you say, folks. It's how you say it. This is your business. This is your bank. My hat says it, BYOB. Everything we talk about is being your own bank. I, I apologize to each and every one of you that sometimes I'm forceful, that sometimes I'm a dick. But you know what? The problem with me is I'm so down, far down this rabbit hole of understanding how to be the bank that I just can't understand why anyone doesn't do this. It literally, when, when I'm challenged by an IUL you know, person saying IULs are better or they're challenged, someone comes and says, oh, I'm making more money in the stock market. I literally want to hand them a sign saying I'm with stupid just so that nobody else has to go through what I'm going through. Like here, you know, just hang, hang on to this sign and put it around your neck. It just says I'm stupid because sometimes that's how I think because you just haven't made that leap yet to understand that you can be your own bank. You can take control of your money and you can earn interest on all your money, no matter what you use that money for. The only thing I tell people not to use this money for is don't use it for your household expenses. Because if that's the best you got for me is to say, oh, I'm going to buy my groceries with my policy and I'm going to pay for my diapers with my policy. I'm going to pay for my fuel on my car with my policy. Although you could, and although it would probably be better than what you're doing today. I have to sit there and challenge you that, that's the best you got. That's the hardest you can make your money go to work. Really, you can't make your money go do anything else and make it work harder for you than buying groceries. That's a zero sum game. Now, all of a sudden, you're agreeing that you're okay just making whatever the guaranteed interest rate is plus dividends on the policy. And I'm sorry, folks, that is not acceptable. It just is not acceptable in today's world because that money can go out there and work for you in so many different ways. We just showed you how to pay back all the loans and take all the money back. But some of you are like, well, this training sucks. I don't have any loans. I'm way past that. I went through Dave Ramsey's baby steps program and I'm debt free. Awesome. Do you own a business? Sure do. Making, making a killing on that business now. Awesome. How do you finance the things in your business? How about your copy machine? How do you do that? Well, we leased that thing. Great. So you got yourself a little copy machine in your office, one of those that kind of looks like this, and you are so proud because you got this great business making all this money, and you leased that copy machine for $171 a month. And just so everybody knows, this is my story, and this makes me feel stupid to tell it, but I'm just going to explain my awakening. So we did this. This was my copy machine. I got to the point where I had no debt, and now I had my business, and my business was using the bank's money still because I still wasn't fully down this rabbit hole. And then when my copy machine lease came up, the copy machine man came in with that suit on and he says, all right, well, I came up with this great proposal for you where we're going to give you a brand new copy machine. It does this X, Y, and Z. It staples your things, folds your paper. Heck, you can even put your ass on the machine and it will print pictures of your butt. Yes, this machine is amazing. And I said, wow, how much is that? He says, all this can be yours for a low monthly Lease payment of $171. I'm like, well, that's not bad. That's what we're paying now. But then all of a sudden, you know, like you got the devil on one side, you got the angel on another. The angel like tugged in my ear and said, Chris, Chris, whoa, 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 whoa. Why don't you just finance that copy machine? I said, oh, yeah. So what I then did is I went to my trusty old stupid whole life policy and I took a loan. I said, Mr. Copy Machine Man, how much money is that copy machine if I just pay cash for it? And he had this dumbfounded look like nobody's ever asked him that question. And he says, well, I don't know. I'd have to check, but I would guess it's going to be about $8,000. And I said, okay, no problem. Can you check on that and see if you can maybe sharpen the pencil a little and maybe get that sucker down to seven grand for me? And he goes back and he comes back and gets close. Gets close. And I say, all right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a loan from my bank. And then I'm going to basically loan that money. Check with your CPA on this, but I'm going to tell you what my CPA said. And I'm going to write a note. Okay. I'm just like if you were to lease the machine, I think you got to sign some paper. Well, I'm going to actually do the same thing. I'm going to do a note to my company for 8%. And I'm going to pay my comp. My company is going to write a check for the exact same amount as they would have written for that lease company, $171. And I just put the money in my corporate bank account. Corporate bank account pays for the copy machine. And every month we set up a bill pay for $171. But that $171 
comes back to my bank. And the best part is, is why did I lease the copy machine in the first place? Well, the copy machine man said that I get a tax deduction. Oh, you can write that lease payment off. Well, do you think I can write this lease payment or this, this note payment off now? You think it's any different because it's my bank financing it versus their bank? My CPA said no. Again, check with your CPA to make sure this is the case, but I still get the tax deduction. But the beauty is, is now I get to keep $171 every month. And if you guys do the math, how much is 171 times five years? 171 times 12. Can someone do the math for me? 171 times 12. It's a, it's a 2052, 2052 a year. Times five years. Is $10,260. $10,260 is how much money my bank got back. And at the end of that five years, and I don't care if it's five years, three years, seven years, doesn't matter. You pick the term, it's your bank. You, you set the terms. That copy machine is owned by my company. And we can do what you saw on Office Space, that awesome movie. When I get pissed off one day, because somebody questions me as to whether or not an IUL is better than a whole life for the infinite banking concept, I just take my damn old copy machine out in the parking lot with a baseball bat and a 12 gauge shotgun. And I have an all out war with that copy machine because it doesn't matter. I got all the damn money back for the copy machine. I'll just go buy another one and make more money. Does everybody understand that? Skip the shotgun part. You can use a baseball bat, but I'm just trying to get you to start thinking about how your money needs to work for you. And that's how I'm using it. That's my story. So well, Brent, Chris, I think not, we should get into some questions here soon. Well, well, Chris, so not only did you get the copy machine, but you got all the money back plus some, and now you still have that copy machine you can continue to use. You can sell it. You can donate it. You can give it away. And then by doing that, by putting that money back into the policy, guess what else you did? You just increased the cash value of the policy. You increased um, the... Um, the amount that's able to be loaned and you increase the death benefit as well. So you increase the legacy and the money stayed in your family. There's no money that leaked out because what Chris just showed you is a closed system. There's no money going out to other people. Now, Chris, I'm going to assume that everybody on this call today has already either watched the full recorded 90 minute presentation, yours or mine. Right. So I'm just going to assume that that they've already seen that. But if, for some reason, they haven't seen the full presentation and they're on this for the first time in the first day ever. Yes, a couple of these examples may be confusing. So I, I'm going to I'm just going to tell you, you guys need to go watch the full presentation. You can go just to our website, themoneymultiplier.com, click on uh, the tab that says resources, and then click on the tab that says presentation to watch my full presentation, or also they can go to Chris's site. You want to give them your example, Chris? You want to put it in the chat box of how they can watch your full presentation? It doesn't matter which one you watch, right? Um, yeah, it doesn't matter. I mean, you just go to my website, chrisnoggle.com, and it'll pop right up. 90-minute video, the same 90-minute yep. video I watched so many years ago that Brent did and forcefully made me watch because I thought I was above watching a 90-minute video because I was a financial advisor. But I watched that video, and I swear to all of you, I cracked the code in 90 minutes. I fully I felt stupid, and I felt relieved at the same time because I learned how I was making mistakes with my money and why I kept riding the roller coaster ride that many of you are riding. This is all. And I that's why you also need to go and watch the backward bicycle video on YouTube. Backward bicycle is because that'll change your mindset. It's on YouTube. It's like seven minutes and 50 seconds long. It's called the backward bicycle video on YouTube. Watch that. And that'll kind of get your mind going in the right direction. But yeah, okay, good. Let's go into the, the question. All right, because there's a lot of great questions that have come through. I've been watching all of your questions as we've been doing this, folks. And a lot of times people learn through questions. So Stephen, uh, are you still with us? Can you help us a little bit just with kind of going through and just hitting some of the key questions for us? Like Dexter's, I'm, I'm doing a policy right now, which is monthly. Unfortunately, I forgot to take a loan the past month. When I do another draft monthly, is another, another premium deposit is what he's talking about. When I apply for the loan, will they deposit two months of loan into the bank? Yeah, 
yeah, Dexter. So it's basically just whatever money you have in cash value would be what your loan would be. You could just take out whatever your loan is. It, it's really easy when you log into the insurance company or you call your mapping specialist, which is what I would I would recommend you do. We literally just click max loan and they'll mail you that loan. But I want to urge you one thing. A lot of people think that the name of this game is just put money in and take a loan out. But I got to ask you, what are you going to do to make that money go to work for you? That's the thing you always need to be thinking. You don't just take loans out. I, I literally back, you know, not luckily, not recently. I've had people take loans out and put the money back in their bank. And they're like, I did a good thing. I did a good thing. I, I, I put the money in this, this stupid whole life. I took the loan out, like you guys said, and I put it back in the bank. Awesome. What's next? And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. You put the money in the bank? Why? Oh, I, I thought that's what I was supposed to do. No, no, no. That money was supposed to go to work for you. Like, don't you have somewhere for it to go? Like, if you hired an employee, would you just tell them to sit on the couch all day while you went off and did all the chores that you hired them to do? No, you'd be like, I need this done. I need that done. I need this done. Pound that nail in, hang that picture, do that. You'd have a, a list of things on how that person would work because you're paying them. Your money wants to work for you. So where are you going to send your money to work? So that would be the best way I'd answer that one for you, Dexter. Unanimous hey, always has good questions. Go ahead, Stephen. I, I can I can read off some of the questions and summarize please, them a little please. bit. Just try and quit hitting that little answer live button so I don't have control over it. But anyway, so um, so somebody's just asking, you know, should they run, basically, is it possible to run everything through the policy, like regular everyday expenses, um, et cetera, or why someone may not want to put all or nearly all their paycheck into the policies? Can we get that Well, so like, let me answer that question. Yes, it's possible to use a policy for anything that you buy. There's no limits or restrictions. The, the, the insurance company is never going to ask you why you're taking a policy loan, and they're never going to ask you if you plan on paying it back. The book, Becoming Your Own Banker, which if uh, you guys haven't read this book, this is the, the Mac Daddy, Nelson Nash, the grandfather, the godfather of the banking concept. This is a book you want to add to your wealth building library. Nelson Nash says on page number 48 of the book, I'm going to read it to you, page 48. Um, he says, it always sounds a bit strange to people when I say premium and income should match. So premium and income should match, meaning if you make $100,000 a year, you should put $100,000 a year into your policy. And now he says, let's start with a very basic fact. All of your money goes through someone else's bank now. When you get your paycheck, it, the thing you do with it is you deposit it into someone else's bank. Then you write checks against it to buy the things you want in life. While the money is in the bank, the banker lends your money to someone else and makes a good living doing it. So all you're doing is you're just changing where the money goes. That's it. Not just changing where the money goes. You're just instead of the money going into your conventional bank account, you're now going to put the money into the policy. That's it. Adding that one simple step. So yes, eventually you want premiums to equal income. But let me just tell you this. Most people can never get there even if they wanted to. Because remember, the thing you can't do is you cannot overinsure a body the same way you can't overinsure a car or house. So there are, I don't know, we have a hundred probably clients in Hannah can tell you that would love to buy more policies. They have more money. They would love to put more money into this, but they can't because they're out of insurable bodies. They've maxed out themselves, their spouses, their children, their grandchildren, or whatever, anybody they have a vested interest in. So anyway, there could be a point where you get to where you have more money and you want to put in more dollars and you just got to go find more bodies, create more people in your life that you have a vested interest in. I always say have more sex, have more children, creates more bodies. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well answered there, BK. Thank you. All right. What's the difference between whole life and universal life? Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to let Chris probably take that. But, I, but um, anyway, I saw that question in the chat box. The thing I want you to do is I want you to send an email to Hannah, H-A-N-N-A-H, -N -N -H, Hannah at the money, what? No, uh, wait, hang on, or do what we do with it? We put it in the box? Okay, never mind on the email. So Hannah's going to go into the chat box, and there's some comparisons that we have about whole life and, and so IULs. But the big thing is this. 
I want you to take your IUL policy and I want you to look at the guaranteed side of the column. And when you look at that side of the column, the thing that you're going to see is the cash value, okay, it goes down and the death benefit goes down. It can go all the way down to zero. Generally, this starts when you're in your late 50s or early 60s. So all the money can disappear because the cost of insurance cannot keep up with the policy. So you never, ever, ever want to use an IUL for this banking concept. I, also on page 69 of Nelson's book. Um, no, it's not 69. It's another page. I, I can't remember the page number, but there's another page in Nelson's book that he goes through why you do not want to use um, an IUL policy, a universal policy, a variable policy or something like that. I, I can't remember what page it's in, it's but on, it's in it's the on book. Page 39. It's on page 39, 39, 39. There you go. That yeah, in the, chat, I mean, right? the easiest way to explain it is, and we've got lots of videos that Stephen put up. We've spent ex extensive time and money explaining the factual contractual differences between an IUL and a whole life. And not only that, like in all transparency, I own a VUL. I own a universal life and Devin on our team owns an IUL. So we know exactly what the contracts say factually. And I will just tell you the single biggest difference is a whole life has a level cost of insurance. So even though we put the death benefit at the lowest, that cost for the death benefit, the cost of insurance is level the rest of your life. So I don't care if you're 15 years old or 90 years old in a whole life, it's the same cost of insurance. A UL works like one year term insurance. Every year you get older, your cost goes up. So let me pose a question. Do you want a vehicle to store your wealth and use the way we just said that every year gets more expensive? Or do you want one that has a completely level cost structure so that you always know exactly what that thing's going to do today and all the way into the future? And the only variable would be the changes in the dividends. And also we didn't hit this earlier, just so everybody knows with dividends, we are at a 32 year low on dividends. Actually, it might even be longer than that. That's just all we have data for. 32 years is the lowest dividends have ever been. So where do you think dividends are going? Lower or higher? I'll leave that up to you. Next question. Well, is also keep in mind, like our inflation rate, we're at a 31, um, right? Is that, so I think it's that a high. We are at a, I believe a 31 year high with inflation. There is no vehicle on this planet that works like this with these features and benefits that is a better way to hedge against inflation. Chris, on our next call, we should probably cover that because Absolutely. that's why we're so busy is because people are just like, hey man, I wanna get my money out of that other crap. I don't want the government being in control and I wanna get it in my own policy, my own banking system, and I want to hedge against inflation. Just before Stephen asked the next question, I just want to address that one question because I don't want to confuse everybody. It's a question from Michael David. And he says, does the loan interest rate go down for everyone, even existing policies? No, it does not. It's only the new policies. And the reason it is, is because remember the 7702 changes? the guaranteed growth has decreased. And there's a podcast on this, Hannah's telling me, right? The Money Multiplier podcast. There is the Money Multiplier podcast on this. So it's only the new policies. But remember, the growth rate is higher on the older policies as well. So um, yeah, I just want to clear that up. Great. All right. Um, it's kind of, do you want me to hit all these questions or just kind of like the more broad ones? Because this yeah, is more, more specific. broad ones, and then we'll get the rest of them in the Ask Me Anything, which happens at 4 30 Eastern time today. And you can ask the rest of the questions and we can do it over a cocktail. All right. I just, I'll just hit it real fast. And anonymous, you can, you, you might be able to get a little bit more into the policy annually, but probably what we designed it for is basically your max, though. Whenever you want to put more money in to grow your banking system, you just start stacking policies, yep. adding additional policies. So plain and simple. And, 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 and anyway, I will tell you 91% of my clients that have been with me a year or longer have more than one policy. They want to come back and do more. So that's what you'll do is you'll add additional policies. Like I got my 22 year old daughter, Hannah, and my assistant that's here. She basically has, 
She basically has five of her own policies at 22. My 20-year-old son has two of his own, not to mention the ones that I own on them. So you will come back and you will buy more policies. Yeah. Well, the first is asking is it because the agent takes a 60 to 90% cut on commission on why we can build these with such strong cash value. Essentially, yes, that's a big part of why we're able to do that as we take that cut. And the way we construct and design it is a little different too. But you know, just right. so everybody knows, like, because there's always questions about, well, if I start a policy, how much should I put in? Well, put in what you're saving today, and that's going to be your ceiling. So if somebody builds a plan for ten thousand dollars a year, that's the most you can ever put in. Like, don't ask us if you can put twelve thousand in the next year because you got to raise. It. The answer is no. But you can always reduce that anywhere between sixty to sixty-five percent, depending on what plan we design. So that ten thousand. Could technically, I'm going to actually give you the real number, 4120. You could reduce that down to the floor of 4120 and then go back to the 10,000 and make up the difference that you didn't. So there's a lot of flexibility built into these. But if you can fund at 10, don't ever not fund it at 10. But if you can't, well, you have roughly 60 to 65 percent on the downside. That you can change your premium deposits after the first year. So that answers a couple of those, Stephen. But you're never, ever going to want to do that. You'll never, ever, ever want to stop paying premium into your policy because you're going to never want to give up that growth. So even if you had to beg, borrow, or steal to get the money, you're going to want to find it because of the growth rate. Yes. Yeah. And if I get one more person asking me, well, when can I stop making premium deposits? I'm going to find a way to teleport to your living room where you're talking or ty yeah. typing. And we're going to have a different kind of discussion. One that would mimic kind of what you'd see in one of those movies with ghosts. Yes. Do not ask us when you would ever stop putting money into the policy, because why in the hell would you ever stop wanting to make deposits into your bank? Yeah, guys. So, yeah. And, and honestly, that question, just if that question is coming up, then we need to do more education to the community because it shouldn't come up. You would never want to stop. Every time, let's say that I showed up at your front yard, every time you gave me a dollar, I gave you back a dollar 20 or a dollar 50 or two dollars or 250. Would you ever, ever, ever want to stop giving me a dollar? Absolutely not. You would want that to continue on forever. Well, that is the same thing here. You never, ever, ever want to stop, like Chris said, depositing money into your own account, your own banking system. Because remember, even though you think that a policy premium is a payment, it is a payment. You are making a payment to the insurance company, but in your mind, you have to think of it as a, as a deposit, not as a payment. And tell me what word do you like better? Payment or deposit? That's right, deposit. Have you ever made too many deposits in your bank account? Never. Go watch the backward bicycle video and you'll understand more about that. This is a paradigm shift. It's a different way of thinking. Yeah. And you know, you could ask the same question. It's in the video, but in what world or what environment does 10,000 equal 13? In the world where you have a perpetual tailwind of uninterrupted compound interest behind your money. So if you were putting 10 in and you got 13 and the next year you're like, oh, I think I'm going to stop making premium deposits because you can, then I would ask you then why would you not want to deposit 10,000 to get 13,000 or more? Because each year the beauty is it goes up. So I got a proposition. How about this? The next time you think that, I want you to call me and I will loan you the $10,000 and all we'll do is you can split the $3,000 with me. And guess where I'm going to loan you the money from? My banking policy. Because my banking policy, I'm putting money in and doing the same thing. So if you need money, call me and Brent. We'll gladly lend it on your policy and take a collateral assignment until you pay us our money. But we're going to take most of your interest because you were just not thinking in the right mindset. And you were saying, oh, I think I'm going to stop making premium deposits. Just call us. We'll gladly lend and rip you off in the interest rate that we charge you. So here's an interesting question. It's... um. I wouldn't mind adding to this a little bit, but how do they pay 6% and charge the 5% interest? Uh, well, the 6% the is, I mean, if you look at insurance companies and how they invest money, it's incredibly conservative and long-term in nature. So just take it this way. Let's just say that the insurance company was buying 30-year treasuries back in the 90s, and they were earning 9% on those 30-year treasuries. So 9% back, you know, 30 years ago or 20 years ago might not have been a great return, but wouldn't 9% be a really good return today? Guaranteed because US Treasury bonds are guaranteed. Yeah. So 
the insurance companies have that perpetual tailwind behind their money. So they've been earning this interest the entire time. So if they're making nine and they're just giving you, let's just say three you know, or 4% uh, in an interest rate and the dividends aren't guaranteed, it's just a return of profits. I mean, all of you understand how a stock works. You buy a stock, if it's a dividend paying stock, it's just this, the company giving you a piece of the profits. Well, insurance companies do the same thing, but their profits aren't called profits because that would be taxable. Their profits are a return of premium, which Dave Ramsey loves to say is a bad thing. The insurance company is just giving you back the, the premiums that they overcharged you on. Good, because now I don't have to pay tax on it. Thank God that's how the insurance company does. They're pretty damn smart. So that's all. They, they have the means to make a much higher interest rate that they can pay you what they do. And then they just return the unused premiums to all of us because they're mutually owned, not publicly traded. And that's how they do it. And then the 5% is an arbitrary number that I don't know that they, I don't know how they figure that 5% out, but it's based on the guaranteed interest rate. They usually charge 1% over that. It's not like how banks do it. It's not tied to prime or anything. Gosh, I've been doing this almost 20 years. And I think back when I first started, interest rates on loans might have been 5.5, and that was 2003. So you can figure out that insurance companies don't really change that a whole lot, but they can. And also keep in mind, there are some insurance companies that charge a higher rate than others. For example, a company called Northwestern Mutual, a company that we do not write with, they don't... Um, all right, so the policies cannot be designed for the infinite banking concept. They charge you an 8% interest rate. So every company that we use charges 5% is, is the max that they charge is 5%. And, on, and then on just the new policies going forward, it's going to be a lower interest rate than that. All right, is there any age limit for whole life? In case we have any older folks on or thinking about parents? Sort of, kind of, but not really. Uh, yeah, actually, Hannah just got someone approved. That how old Hannah? The one lady. She was seventy-eight years old. Yeah, and then I was then surprised. I didn't think that would happen, but they approved her at age seventy-eight. I usually say about seventy-three, seventy-four is the cutoff. But remember, even if you're that age, or even if you have bad health, you can always insure another body. You can always insure another body. Everything works the same way, except the policy is not on your body. You can insure a spouse, a child, a grandchild, a niece, a nephew, somebody you have a business interest, a, some kind of business interest in. As a matter of fact, up until about, I don't know, what was it, Chris, like seven, eight, 10 years ago, Walmart was insuring every single one of their employees without them even knowing about it. They can still do it. They just, now they just have to tell them about it. Yep. And, uh, you know, that's what banks do. That's why you see so many vice presidents at banks. They're all executives of the bank. So the bank can then take out an insurance policy on them. And they do. Why do you suppose Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman won't acknowledge this concept? Surely they know about it, but maybe they won't share because it requires explanation they don't want to get into. Oh, I got to take this one, man. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Take it. But before take he this. takes it, just let me tell you this. What the... So the thing we have done in the past is we have tried to, to debate, not really debate, have a discussion with Dave Ramsey, but he, you know, he's not going to talk to us. I've never tried Susie Orman, but even me and other colleagues have tried to talk to Dave Ramsey about it, but he won't do it. Yeah. So, you know, Dave Ramsey, he's got a bit of an ego if you haven't figured that out, but Dave Ramsey does know a lot about traditional regular whole life. And he did a video called Infinite Banking is a Scam. And in that video, he really buried himself and let us all know that he has no idea how this works. He has no idea that these policies are specially designed and engineered. And a matter of fact, he doesn't even know the insurance companies that do this because he said Prudential. And Prudential is not even a mutually owned insurance company that he ever could be considered for this. So the reason Dave Ramsey talks about term insurance is the same reason why you see every insurance company out there advertising term insurance all the time, every commercial, term insurance, term insurance. How many times do you see a commercial from an insurance company advertising good old fashioned whole life? Come down to XYZ insurance company and get your whole life. Never. Why do you think that is? Well, I'll tell you why. Term insurance, that product is for a term of time. Can anyone tell me how much uh, in a percentage, how many times does the insurance company have to pay out on term insurance policies that they issue? The answer is less than 1%. So 
So if you were a business and you had a product that you sold that only had to pay out 1% or less of all the ones you sold and you never had to fulfill anything else because the rest of them just lapsed because of time, wouldn't that be the product that you would advertise? Man, I'm not a very smart business owner, but if I had a product like that, that I only had to deliver on less than 1%, that'd be the only damn thing I ever talk about because that is called pure, unadulterated profit for the insurance companies. Why do you think you only have been taught term insurance is what you should do because it's cheap? Because everybody says, buy term, invest the difference. Who, who are you investing the difference with, with Dave? Oh, the mutual fund camp families. Mutual fund families, are they free? No, they're expensive. So they all try to sell you term, the most profitable product, then get you to put the difference in another product called mutual funds, which are incredibly profitable for the insurance companies. But what isn't so profitable for the insurance company? Whole life insurance, but it's been around for hundreds of years. So now do you understand why Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman and the insurance companies always want you to think buy term, invest the difference is the only thing you should do? Wake up, people. It's kind of like saying out there, everything as you hear is exactly what it really is. Peel the curtain, man. Red pill or blue pill, watch the matrix. Like this is real. And that is why that's all you know and all they talk about. And you think Dave Ramsey's maybe getting a cut of that term insurance? I think maybe. I like it. I like it. Um, so while you're on a rant, Chris, any comments on... Uh... Mr. Curtis Ray of MPI Unlimited and how he uh, doesn't agree with infinite banking and what our opinion is of he or and or his company. All he does is quote unquote compound interest. Yeah, I, I wanted to, you know, make friends, not friends, but I wanted to like have a nice discussion with Curtis Ray, but another one that is arrogant and, you know, has already arrived as Nelson Nash's book talks about the arrival syndrome. Curtis Ray has arrived. He, he knows everything. There's nothing new for Curtis Ray to, to learn because Curtis Ray's got an agenda called MPI, which is a product that he created and sells that if you really want to know about it, why don't you just Google? Because I don't know where people have forgotten to do their due diligence. Why don't you just Google Kurt, Curtis Ray? If, they, if his thing is so good, and if he says that the infinite banking concept in whole life is so bad, then why don't you just Google Curtis Ray? Is Curtis Ray's MPI a scam? Or is Curtis Ray, you know, whatever, just Google it all. I did. And if you do what I did, you will find some things that you don't like, like lots of complaints against Curtis Ray. And lots of people saying that Curtis Ray is doing something that is not sustainable. And lots of things saying that Curtis Ray is not giving you the full truth. And on, and on, and on, and on. And these aren't just individuals posting on Reddit. These are articles being put up. I can't remember what publications. So folks, like sometimes when you see something on TikTok or Instagram or Facebook, and you just take it as the gospel, where the hell did we stop doing our due diligence and looking up things? Because I know, I bet you, any of you, if you're looking at this money multiplier thing and these whole lives and all this stuff that that guy, Chris and Steven and Brent are talking about, I sure hope you're Googling it. And I sure hope you're looking, is there, is there any negative comments out there about the money multiplier or Chris Noggle or Brent Kessler? Do it. Go ahead. I give you the, the token, the, the hall pass to go research all of it that you want. And what you will find will wake your ass up because you will see that there's a whole bunch of very negative things about Mr. Curtis Ray, the best there is, and the IUL king with his MPI strategy, which is the almighty. Just Google it. Okay. And then why don't you just Google just for the shits and giggles, Brent and Chris and the money multiplier and see what you find out about us. And then come back to us and report back with a 30 page report on what your findings are. And I got something for free for you. Sound good? Look at that, man. The dog loved that one too. Yeah. All right. Give the dog a bone. All right. I got to get right. off in five minutes, guys. I got to go at 2.56 Eastern time. All right, Stephen. What do we got? We got any more questions here? I think he's going to his dog. Let's see. Extra deposits. What do we got? Yeah, we got a, we got a bunch of questions. We're probably going to have to to be continue these or do them later or next week. Well, even if Brent gets off, I'm happy to stay on and do a couple of questions for people. Okay. I can stay on for a few more. Okay. Well, let's go into them. All right. Um, let's see. Do some folks take out a policy loan each month quarter, or use it to pay their monthly expenses to make payments with interest back? Okay. Watch my video on YouTube. It's, you know, telling you why you should not do that. And if you remember earlier, that's where I was saying, you know, is that the best you got? Is that all you can do with your money? Is that the hardest you can make your money work is go buy groceries, diapers, and pay for your fuel in your car? So you can do it. 
it is talked about. It's taught, you know, there's a lot of people doing that. I just simply believe that you could do better than that. I think your money can work harder than your grocery bill and harder than your fuel bill and harder than the diapers. So I just pose you and I just challenge you to try to make your money work just a little bit harder than paying for your household bills. When we talk about money you spend and money you keep, keep spending that money. When your policies are really mature, you know, seven, eight, 10 years later, and your spread is so big on for, because of all that compound interest, then maybe you can do it. You know, Brent, I don't know if you pay all, do you pay, pay your household bills with your policies? No, I don't. I take money from my policies and I want to go out and find other investments, whether I'm buying more real estate, um, right? I'm buying long-term rentals, short-term rentals, doing hard money lending. So that's what I want to do. I want to maximize that money. I borrow from the the policy and I make the loan or I make the investment and I'm making money on that investment, right? And then I'm also making the money in the policy because not only am I getting paid on that investment, but I'm also getting paid on the money being in the policy. Because when I took that policy loan, I never took the dollars out of the policy. I simply put my policy up for collateral and I took a loan from the general fund of the insurance company. So no, I don't get into paying bills with it and things like that. As a matter of fact, I will still continue to use a conventional bank's money if I get a, a, a low interest rate. Because I mean, right now we can borrow from a conventional bank at two, three, four percent. Well, I'll use that in addition to the money that I'll get from my policy. Now, the one thing is about that is it's not for everybody. You have to be disciplined with your money because remember when you borrow from a bank, you give up control and you have to pay the bank back on their terms and not your terms. So as you know, Chris and Steven, we have a lot of clients and we have some clients that are extremely disciplined with money. I mean, they're really, really good, but then we have other clients that they're not. They think just because they have checks left, there's still money in the bank, right? So those people would not be a good candidate for that. So it just depends on where you're at um, just with your money mindset. But no, I don't use it to pay ordinary bills. I agree with you, Chris. All right. Um... So I'm just trying to figure, so I missed my spot here. Do some, uh, let's see, I have loans out on both my policy. I have separate account for my recapture. I also have multiple savings accounts where I hold money for things that come up once a year, for example, vacation time, share Christmas. Would it be beneficial to add up those savings and put it back into my policies and then take a loan for those yearly expenses? You want to hit that one, Brent? Um, <laughs> it's kind of a lot. That was a lot. I don't know if I got the question, to be honest with you. But I think it's the same question about, do we want to use that money to pay for expenses? I mean, yes, you can, guys. Listen, it's infinite. You can do whatever you want with the money of the policy. But there's probably better things to do than trying to pay your electric bill and recapture the electric bill. Yes. But OK, so the most important thing is this is capitalize, capitalize, capitalize. Never, ever be afraid to capitalize your policy. So for, so the question was, or it came from someone or a couple of people that said, when can I stop paying the premium? Well, why in the hell do you want to? That means you're afraid to capitalize. You're afraid to make deposits into your bank. So that's the most important thing. Whenever money comes in, you want to try to get as much or all of that money into the policy. And then from there, take that money and use it for the things you're doing in life anyway. It could be for a car, a house, a boat, a bicycle. It could be an investment piece of property. I, I mean, hell, it could even be used to buy stocks and bonds if you really want to do that. Or if you really love these IUL policies, then go buy yourself an IUL policy. I would never buy one because I would never sell one, right? But all right, but the thing, you could go and buy an IUL policy. That's what we tell people. If you really, really want an IUL policy, put your money in the whole life policy, take the loan, and now go buy the IUL policy. Because remember, all of those other items that we talked about, including an IUL, it's an investment, which means it can go up and it can go down. That's the definition of an investment. It can go up and it can go down. The whole life policy can never, ever go down. It only gets better with time. Today's better than yesterday. Tomorrow's better than today. That's not me telling you that is in the policy contract. You will see that in your contract before you ever sign, pay, and accept the policy. 
All right, guys, I'm checking out. I'll see you next week. Hey, Brent. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. All right, Brent. Yeah, somebody's just asking about loans, Chris. You can take as many loans as you want, um, you know, as long as there's cash value in the policy. There's not a limit on those. So the cash value is going to build as you put deposits in and as the compounding effect takes place. So you could take loans without having to repay the loans first, as many, basically as many as you want, you know, in the same year Absolutely. is all good. Um, is Boley the same thing in concept? What you all are describing here, can you explain Boley, bank loan life insurance? Yeah, so bank owned life insurance is what is commonly, you know, what the banks are doing. So the bank is actually owning life insurance on their executives quote, you know, VPs and other executives. So the concept is identical. So if you owned a bank, let's, let's get into like big banks. Let's just say Bank of America. When you buy a whole life on your VP, do you think you're going through an agent like your broke ass brother-in-law paying a, a commission of 55 to 90% to that brother-in-law? No, the bank's going direct to the insurance company, working with a division in the insurance company that we get the privilege to work with the Bully and Coley division. I'll just kind of call it that. And the bank and the insurance company have this relationship where the commissions are severely reduced because the majority of the money is going into the bank's policy in terms of cash value. Really, the differentiating, the differentiation is really either the agent or the advisor is going to get a bigger commission or you're going to have more money to use in your policy. Yes, it's in how it's designed and engineered, but just keep the simple way. You, if you love your agent, and you love your advisor from whatever company they're at, then sure, give them the commission. And that just means that you're going to have less money. And I hope they mail you a really good Christmas present. So Boley, Coley, and what we do with privatized banking, it's all the same thing. It's just in engineering how we design the contract. And the contracts we design give you the majority of the cash value to use immediately and allow you to tap into all the benefits that whole life provides that we talk about. Right. Can I hit Terrence's asking. real quick? Because this is this is important. Just yes. started my IBC policy. Should I drop my term life policy or continue? Easy one. What was the term insurance taken out for? First question. Oh, I took it out to protect uh, debts that I have, mortgages that I have. Then the answer is keep the term insurance. When you're setting up your IBC policy, yes, there will be a death benefit. Yes, it might be a lot or maybe not. But I want you to think of this as this is your banking system, your life insurance, your term insurance is to protect something for a term of time. I have a million dollar term policy that protects mortgages I have out on my rental properties. My rental property mortgages are 25 year mortgages. My term insurance policy is a 30 year policy. Do you see that? That's all term insurance should be used for. It's something you're protecting for a term of time. Unlike Dave and Susie and all the other gurus out there that say term insurance is the only thing you should owe, why? So that someday later you're guaranteed not to have life insurance for your family? Shame on you, shame on them. Like your family is more is worth more than that to you. Your children should be worth a lot more than that. So term insurance is for something that you're protecting for a term of time. Everything else should flow through this system and that will provide you a legacy for the rest of your life. I don't care if you live to 121 years old, you're covered. All right. All right, we're getting there. Um, somebody's asking they have an old VUL if they should 1035 exchange it into a special whole life insurance. Do you think that's a good idea? Oh, Rolando, I've seen a lot of questions come through from them today. Uh, I have a VUL with New York Life. I took it out in 2004. Uh, I hate the damn thing. Okay, I don't have any money in the mutual funds in there. I have 100% of my money in stable value, which I'm sure you have in your uh, selection of the different options. I have not 1035 exchanged mine yet for one reason and one reason only. I'm not out of the surrender period. Those surrender periods back in the day were like 12 years, whatever yours is. So if you're past the surrender period, I would say you know there's a pretty good chance that that would make a lot of sense for you to, to 1035 exchange. But if you're in your surrender period, how much money are you gonna lose by doing that? And that's something to consider. For me, I haven't transferred mine over, but I certainly will. I just, I, I actually, I think this year coming up is when I'm out of my surrender and that sucker's freaking gone. It's garbage. It has, it has underperformed so poorly from what it initially should have done. And I wrote the damn policy. Like I was the agent, the advisor that sold myself the VUL policy. Cause back then that's just like what we thought was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And it has underperformed in a bull market when it should have, it should have crushed my numbers. So use that for however you will. I love that I have personal examples of a lot of this because I can just tell you my stories on how I do things and why I do them. 
and I don't have to guess on anything. All right. Yeah, still surrender charges for six more years. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. I mean, here's what I'd suggest. Obviously, you know, if you listen to anything I say, there's there's a big market crash coming. I would take the gains that you have in there, move them into something very conservative, government bonds, which I'm sure you probably have a government bond option in your mutual fund selection or the stable value or the, the fixed guaranteed account. Just move most of it in there. Maybe keep new dollars you're putting into the VUL going into the mutual fund you know, portfolio that you have, but protect your money. That's law number three of the laws of wealth. Protect your money. All right. I think we did it. All right. If you like that video, make sure you check out this video right now. And also don't forget, subscribe to my channel and don't ever forget to smash that alert button. We'll see you on the next one.